Hey, Anthony, how are you? I'm great, Eric. I can't believe how long it is since we last spoke. And it's a real pleasure to be on the podcast today. Looking forward to this. Absolutely. So Anthony and I, before we started recording, we were just um, trying to remember when the last podcast episode was. So we went back and it was five, almost six years ago, 2018. Scary. It was episode 54. Yeah. I think we're in the 300s now. We're in the yeah. mid 300s. So I can't believe it's been that long. I think you were in Los Angeles when we do. Did we do it in L.A.? Because you and I, we had lunch. Yeah. Remember? Maybe that was after we recorded the podcast. Yeah, or before, I can't remember. It was quite a while ago. But it was a very nice lunch. I remember that much. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, 2018. Wow. If only only we'd known then what we know now. (laughs) Isn't it incredible? And and who knows what the next six years hold. But uh, life is uh, full of all sorts of surprises, not all of them good. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed you know, listening to everything you've been doing over those years, including, you know, how you handled uh, COVID and, you know, the role that you took, the industry sort of perspective that you took. That was uh, very interesting. So, uh, yeah, congratulations on that. I think you did a great job. And and your empire continues to expand. So uh, (laughs) well done. Yes, we're we're doing the best we can over here and uh, in the post-COVID world, but uh, things seem to be doing fine and our beauty pros are, are uh, happy and successful. And, you know, we're coming off of the holiday season. And one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about today um, is maybe some word on the street that maybe the holiday season isn't quite the holiday season of, of, uh, of past years in the salon mm. business. That maybe, uh, you know, I've heard, I've read some articles and some, some trade media talked to some hairdressers who said that maybe they're less busy this year um, and their clients have booked for January and February. And I I, I don't know, you know, where where it falls within the the landscape of the industry. So I was interested to to ask you that. However, however, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting it. I, I segued into my first question without introducing you. Our listeners, I'm sure most of our listeners know who you are, but just in case some don't, Anthony Whitaker, you're the founder, you're a legend in the industry, you're a founder of Grow My Salon Business, which is an online platform, uh, you speak, you have books, you have a website, you have a podcast, and your goal aims to empower hairdressers to grow their businesses quite simply. Did I do a good enough job? You did a fantastic job. I, I, I was going to take notes, actually. I thought, who is, who is this guy? <laughs> he sounds like competition. <laughs> yeah, so that's who you are, um, the modesty and all. And um, the last episode, like I said, was episode 54, 2018. And so n- let's go to my first question. What, what, what do you think? I mean, you talk to a lot of hairdressers. You talk to a lot of salon owners. And what are you seeing out there? Well... I mean, I do. I have a lot of online contact in different countries with you know different uh, salon owners, and it's not the same picture everywhere. But if you had to make a sort of a generalized statement, you would say that the consumer is being cautious, that the economy um, is a little bit unpredictable, um, inflation you know, had a a big impact on the industry. COVID had a big impact on the industry. The rise in cost of living had a big impact on the industry, no matter where you are in the world. But I think in some countries, that impact was greater than others. And even within countries, in some states, you would see that that impact is greater than others. Um, I think generally speaking, the industry's bounced back. But I think there's a lot of cautious optimism um, because the world is a very volatile place at the moment. You know, you only have to turn on the news if you're that way inclined to sort of very quickly want to turn it off because you really don't know what sort of climate, you know, economically, politically we're living in. And I think that maybe one of the things that happened with COVID is it made people realise, and I hate even saying the C word, but it, it, it sort of made people realise that actually business can be quite vulnerable, and 
you need to not just rely on cash flow and think that everything's going to be good forever, that you need to, you know, sort of sock some stuff away and you need to be looking at your business um, more like a business and not just a, uh, you know, a, a, a hobby or a, um, you know, something that just breaks even all the time and gives you a nice lifestyle. That's the word I was thinking of. I was thinking of, you don't want it to be just a lifestyle business. You want it to be a business that, um, you know, can stand on its own two feet and that can grow and that is, you know, genuinely profitable. And I think that the last few years have really made people in varying degrees sort of um, recognize that they needed to take their business seriously, not just the hairdressing component of it, but the business component of it. Absolutely. So there's there's a lot to what you just said. Let's start with maybe one of the first things I got from what you said, which is, okay, let's say your clientele is being cautious. And let's say that they're spreading out their appointments from let's say every six weeks to every whatever, 12 weeks, yeah. okay? What can you do as a hairdresser behind the chair to fill those uh, those empty spots on your book? Well, you know, a lot of it comes down to the most simple, you know, tried and tested things that are not particularly new and not particularly, you know, based on social media or new technology, AI, whatever, it's just about giving people a great experience. You should always give people a five-star experience. And um, I, I know there's a little bit of a pushback at the moment that I'm hearing about that people are, are, are suggesting that maybe you don't need to pre-book as much. And I think that with the way hair has been for the last few years, um, and you know, a few giving me quite a bit of latitude, is that people don't need to, women in particular, don't often need to go to the salon nearly as much as they used to because you know I've been in the industry a long time over 40 years and there's been eras of hairdressing where people have you know it's been all about the haircut and so they're in every four to six weeks this is not one of those eras okay now if you've got an older clientele they are probably still in you know more likely to be in every say four to six weeks or maybe eight weeks for a regular cut but if you're looking at that sort of demographic of say 20 to 40 or whatever there's a lot of long hair and it simply isn't um, a, a case of it being necessary for them necessarily to go into the salon and get a haircut every four to six weeks. Um, and the type of color work we're seeing, uh, a lot of generalizations I'm making here, of has also mean that it's color that is okay that it can look growing out. Now, there's obviously opportunities to get people in for treatments, there's opportunities to get people in for toners, etc. But it's not like it was, say, you know, 20, 25 years ago, where it was more like highlights and foils and people not wanting a regrowth so much. So between the haircut and the color, um, it, it's meant that people were not visiting the salon so often. And because they're not visiting it so often, that also impacts on the ease of rebooking. Because if I said to you right now, you know, Eric, do you want to rebook your next appointment in four or five weeks time, or whatever, you would get your diary out. Four or five weeks is sort of manageable. But the reality is, is that a lot of women now are not, you know, visiting the salon more than, say, three, four times a year tops. So what you're saying to them is, do you want to get your diary out and book your next appointment for four months? And a lot of people are like, oh, my God, I don't know where I'm going to be in four months. And so there's, there's maybe a tendency for some people to, to not be wanting to rebook as clients, as well as, you know, a lot of professionals in the industry are not wanting to rebook people. But I would go back to if you've got, if you've got empty uh, uh, columns, uh, empty appointments in your book, a lot of white space that, you know, giving people great service. Uh, consistently every time and rebooking people before they walk out the door is is the most simple and most effective way of uh, trying to keep those people locked in and locked into your column. So with the service, with the giving great service, which is, that's a large category and, you know, I can put it in quotes and it's going to mean different things to different people. If you were to pinpoint the one or two biggest uh, issues these days that you're seeing people getting a little lazy on, a little lackadaisical, 
what would you say it, it, with regards to the service? I would say that the first thing you should do is <laughs> go to Barnes and Noble, Barnes and Noble or Amazon, and buy a brilliant book. And I, I'm sure you've probably got this on your nightstand. Uh, I've got it next to me at the moment. It's called Unreasonable Hospitality by Will Gadara. It is a phenomenal book, and it, it, you know, have you read it, Eric? I <clears throat> yes, many many years ago, many right. years ago. Okay, well, you know, he obviously isn't from the hair industry, he's from the you know, hospitality, the restaurant industry. But, and I know he spoke recently um, at Serious Business. Unfortunately, I weren't there, I didn't see him, but I heard he was very good. But the book is brilliant. And he talks in that book about service and about giving clients what he terms as unreasonable hospitality. And it's just a great reminder about how to really set what you do apart. I mean, the, you know, things, I, that, things that are unexpected, right? Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. Going that like extra mile. Like I was getting my car, you know, um, you can edit this out if you want. It's just a little anecdote that I just saw today in, in real time. And I just thought, wow, that's beautiful. I was getting my car service today and uh, uh, I waited because I had to do the brakes. I was going to be there a couple of hours. So I took my laptop down and I sat there and, and had a coffee and stuff. And there was a guy that came in also getting his car done. You know, there were several people in the, in the waiting area. And he had a son with him. And his son was about three or four years old. And this was a, a BMW Mini dealership. And um, the son was like, you know, walking around looking at everything. And the manager of this dealership went and got a, he opened up a, a glass cabinet, like a display cabinet. And there was a little toy, you know, we used to call them matchbox cars. I don't know what they call yep. them now, but it was yep. like a little mini. And he gave it to this kid as a gift. And I just looked at that and I just thought, wow, that is just a brilliant experience. Like yes. that kid's going to remember that experience. His dad was blown away, you know. Yep. And I can remember when I was a kid, I used to love things like that. I'd play with them forever. And so it's just these little bits of hospitality, unexpected bits of hospitality that our industry also lends itself to be able to do. And I thought, you know, reading that book, it was just a, you know, a fantastic book with lots of examples of how in the restaurant industry, they do that and how important it is. And I think it's equally as important in our industry. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but, you know, I think you, you 100% have. We're definitely not editing out that anecdote because I think it's the perfect example of how to, to break through something which I think plagues our industry to some degree, and that is the familiarity that we have with our clients who come in, who've been coming in for years, you know, they're, they feel like friends, they are friends. Sometimes that familiarity um, uh, results in a routine that where a lot of the hospitality falls by the wayside. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, Janice is coming in. Oh, it's just Janice. You know, mm, mm. You, you, you know, I've known Janice for years and, you know, I, I don't need to do anything special for Janice kind of a thing. Yeah. And I, I get this sense uh, from from people and I get the sense from when when I'm a client um, with with the hairdressers that I go to. So. I think it's it's a great, hopefully this can jar some people into thinking, oh, you know what? I'm guilty of that. Maybe I need to treat Janice as if I, I really appreciate her, uh, as if I'm trying to attract her as a new long-term uh, client versus taking her for granted, maybe. Yeah. I have a expression I talk about with, with hairdressers where I, I say to them, they're not your friends, they're your clients. No, they'll be friendly to you and you'll be friendly to them. But you probably don't go around their house for dinner. Their friends do. And, and that's a distinction. Now, you know, I had lots of clients I was very friendly with. I mean, one of my, arguably my best friend, he's the godfather to my children. He started off as a client. He is, mm. now he's our, he's our, he's our family. Um, but he's one out of hundreds. And a lot of them I had a, a very cordial relationship with, a very friendly relationship with. Maybe I'd get invited to a few parties, etc., which I did. But I was friendly to every one of them, and they were friendly to me. But it was still a client relationship. 
And uh, I think it's always important to remember that. And, you know, your your little example there of, you know, Janice walks in and you think, oh, it's only Janice, she'll be OK. Well, no, she won't be OK. Like, she, she, she'll be sitting there, assuming it's not, you know, an environment where she's the only client and you're the only stylist. She'll be sitting there and she'll be watching other clients come in who maybe are new clients and all of a sudden they get fussed over and they get their coat taken and they get their bag taken and they get offered refreshments and and they get called sir or ma'am and they get the chair turned for them and all that sort of stuff that you might do. But when it's Janice, who's been coming for a year or a couple of years, whatever, you're sort of like, well, she'll help herself to a coffee. She knows where the changing room is. She knows where the magazines are. It'll be okay if I run 10 or 15 minutes late. But you know what? It won't be. Janice has got a choice and she can go elsewhere. People need to remember that. So, you know, these days, you know, when I talk about, and I don't want to jump the gun here, but often when I talk about social media, one of the things I say is that as an industry, I think we're good at the first, um, you know, I, I talk about marketing as being three things. It's about attracting new clients. It's about turning them into regulars and it's about keeping them as long as possible. Mm-hmm. Now, I think as an industry, generalization, we're good at attracting new clients, you know, through social media, through Instagram. But we're terrible at number two and number three, which is turning them into regulars and keeping them as long as possible. And all the data from all the point of sale systems, etc., will reinforce that, that we don't keep people long term. And it's because we are not, you know, from a marketing perspective, we're not thinking about how do I turn that client to a regular and how do I keep them as long as possible? And it's not necessarily about spending money. It's about what you've alluded to. It's about service or, you know, in a broader context, it's about the experience that you give people. And if you fail to give them that great experience and give it to them consistently, you only need to mess up once and you'll lose them. Yeah. Something else that you mentioned in your first comment was treating your career, your profession uh, like a business versus a kind of a lifestyle thing that you do. Mm-hmm. And part of that is being responsible with money, isn't it? Yeah. So you've got, let's say, $100 coming in. You can't spend $100 in the same period of time. You need to start saving. Now, what is your best advice for a client who is notoriously bad at managing their money? For a client, meaning? Um, I, I, when I say client for you, I'm talking about a beauty professional. <laughs> right, okay, okay. Um, well, where do you start? Okay, so I, I've, I've just launched a, uh, a, a course uh, that I do called Money. And, um, you know, as you know, I do a series of different courses that cover different areas of the industry, whether it's marketing or management or finance. And the finance one, the money one, is the Achilles heel of hairdressers everywhere. Uh, and I'm going to say everywhere, I mean everywhere. It, it's, you know, as a, as a generalization, we are not great with the financial side of running a business. We're not great with the numbers. And I'm going to stop myself there and say that's uh, because, uh, you know, I, I talk about that and I say we are good with numbers when it's the numbers that suit us. So the numbers on a tube of color, the numbers on a bottle of peroxide, they're numbers. The the numbers that represent the the, the depth of hair color are numbers. And we have learned the language of numbers in a hairdressing context, in a coloring of hair context. And you can just as easily learn the language of numbers in a business context. If you sat your bookkeeper or accountant down and you said, uh, you started talking about a a depth of a level seven and I'm gonna use a 10 stroke nine and 40 vol or whatever, they'd look at you like you were from another planet. But unfortunately, when your bookkeeper or accountant starts talking to you, you know, uh, about the numbers in your P&L, Often the hairdresser looks at them like they're from another planet. But just like you've learned how to understand the numbers in hairdressing, because you didn't come out of secondary school knowing those numbers, you went to beauty school and you learned those numbers and, you know, of of the, the numbers in hairdressing, so to speak. And you can also learn the numbers of business. And the good news is it's not that complicated. You know, it's it's like anything. It's like, you know, you 
put one foot in the well, one step at a time, uh, one foot in the water at a time, whatever. And you build on that knowledge like everything. And uh, you know, so that's why I put that course together because as an industry, it is so desperately needed because of the questions that come to you are always like connected to the numbers. So the questions that are most commonly asked in this industry uh, is how do I pay my people if you've got staff and how do I price my services, whether you've got staff or whether you buy yourself. And so both of those things come down to numbers. They come down to percentages. They come down to some, you know, a bit of math, some simple equations. And uh, it's not that difficult to, you know, to get a handle on those things. You know, like the hairdressing industry is a very simple business model. It's not like as a salon owner that you have, you know, research and development and that you have people on 30, 60, 90 days, etc. You don't have any of that. It's a simple business model from a financial perspective. And if you're going to open a business, whether it's a business unit of one or whether you aspire to employ people and grow, uh, do not do that if you're not committed to up your education and start to master the financial aspects of business. Mm hmm. Okay, so talk about your money program. Is this online? Is it videos? Is it books? I, um, it's, a, the, it's the most recent course I've done. I've been doing a course called Super Stylist, one called Management, one on Marketing, one on Team Building for ages, because they're transferable across all nationalities, across all countries. But as soon as you start talking about money, you have a lot of differences, not just different currencies, but different laws around tax and all that sort of stuff. Mm. So I'd sort of left it alone as, as a course or as a book because it was too complicated. But uh, as a online course, we um, are, are doing some things where as well as the course itself, we do uh, online group coaching calls. So there's a face-to-face -face element. And we do some of those calls that are country specific where I will bring in a accountant who is from that country who can, uh, so for example, I'm doing something very shortly with a lady from an accountancy firm called Copsa Oti, which is uh, you know based in the US. They've got salon clients in, in 42 different states. So she can talk to the, you know, the, the idiosyncrasy Syncrasies um, of a specific country. But in interestingly, you know, particularly when you're talking about America, it's not just about the idiosyncrasies of a particular country. It's the idiosyncrasies of different states. Because, right. you know, in many ways, um, when I'm talking to someone in California and then talking to someone in, I don't know, New Jersey or somewhere, you may as well be in a different country because, mm -hmm. you know, the laws uh, and the tax situations are radically different. They're as different as California to, you know, to Sydney, Australia, or to, to you know, London, England. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I talk a lot about the formulas behind, you know, how to uh, work out how to pay your people. I talk a lot about the formulas about how to price your services. And I think that they're transferable everywhere. I talk about formulas of, you know, uh, or, or not so much formulas, but um, how to get people more productive on your team. Again, that's very transferable everywhere. I talk about the benchmarks in business. And, you know, benchmarking from a financial perspective is, is really interesting. Um, and, you know, there's some, some, you know, great books that have been done recently on that. Um, that you know gives some really good uh, starting points, but they're not applicable. It, it, I suppose what I'm trying to allude to here is this: every business is different, so it's not just every country is different or every state is different. It's every business is different. Mm. So ultimately, I think what you're often doing is you're benchmarking against yourself, your own performance. This is what I did last year: was that good? Was that bad? And what am I doing this year? How do my numbers compare this year to my numbers last year? So. Um, you know, the money course is like this online program where we have a series of, of nine different modules. It's broken down into 55 different lessons. I try and keep the lessons short because if they're too long, especially when you're talking about money, it becomes overwhelming for people. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, so some of those is short, like five minutes. 
um, a little bit longer than that. Some of them are sort of 10, 15 minutes. I think the longest ones are probably uh, 25, 30 minutes, you know. Um, some things you can't really break down and do justice to them, but where possible, I try and keep them, you know, around that sort of 15 minute mark, which is, uh, you know, usually doable. Um, and then when you combine that with the group coaching calls, um, you know, it, it's very, um, you know, it's pretty much a sort of a, a turnkey course that you can work your way through at your own pace and uh, uh, not feel that you're in a group environment where everyone's getting rushed through at the same pace and, and you want to stop. So whether you've, you know, had a business for 10 or 20 years or whether you've just started in business, you can work through at the pace that works for you. Mm-hmm. Very smart. Very smart. Um, <clears throat> and, and I think that... Uh, I think money is very intimidating to a lot of people in our industry, not even in our industry, a lot of people. And it's surrounded in so much emotion and shame. If we're not good with it and we're doing bad, badly with it, we're, we, our credit card bill is high and we get notifications that it's hit its max or whatever. We don't even want to go look at it because of the sense of shame, which of course can spiral it downward. And so to... For somebody like that to put themselves in a position where they can empower themselves and and shed the emotion um, that is that is preventing them from getting a hold of their situation and improving it, I think is really important. And and it sounds like your course does that, can help with that. Yeah, well, it definitely does. And I think that um, being a hairdresser, you know, I'm I'm a salon owner. I'm a hairdresser. Like so. You know, if, if I have a, a a skill, it's making complicated things less complicated. And I think that one of the things that I started to learn was that when it comes to finance is that it's it's complicated for the sake of it in a lot of cases. It's like sometimes it's the same word mm-hmm. or it's the same thing, but there's five different words for it. Right. And, and so no wonder people get confused. I mean, people get confused about the most simple terminology the word profit if you ask five hairdressers what is profit you get five different answers and ultimately the reason you go into business is to make a profit but a lot of people you know that i talk to they don't realize that actually they're not making a profit they think of they think of their um uh the profit as being their wages now yeah I, I will qualify this because I know a lot of uh, your people are an independent, you know, business unit of one. Yeah. So for them, yeah, it, it, it is like the profit is all for them. But if you've got a business with, you know, two, three, four, five people or whatever, uh, then the profit, the, the net profit. So, you know, we've got the gross profit, we've got the operating profit, then we've got the net profit. And even then, when you've got that net profit, it's like, well, what are you going to do with that? Because you might keep it as retained earnings in the business because of exactly what we spoke about at the beginning of this, that mm-hmm. businesses need to have a buffer. And, you know, when uh, 2020 happened, what happened with salons all over the world? None of them had a buffer. As mm-hmm. soon as the cash flow stopped, it was like musical chairs, you mm-hmm. know, and there was a lot of people left standing and not enough seats. You know, sure. Or, so or just January and February, you know, you know when, when, when your appointments slow down. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And, and, and it's really easy for people to go, yeah, but that was a pandemic. That's a once in a lifetime thing. But it. It it had so much publicity because it was a global thing, okay? Mm -hmm. And it affected the whole world. It affected all of us for a long time. But the reality of it is, is that that happens every day. You you would have people in your salon suites who, for whatever reason, all of a sudden the cash flow stops. Is it through illness themselves or a a loved one, a partner? Mm -hmm. Uh, Is it through, um, you know, sometimes political unrest? Is it through uh, climate you know, changes, floods, storms. Uh, is it through, um, uh, you know, a car accident? You know, is, is it through uh, parents or children that all of a sudden you have to look after? There are so many things that can cause upheaval in every business. You know, what happened four years ago, just put it on the front page and it happened to everyone at the same time. Right. But every day of the week, there are people out there in business that for whatever reason, you know, things stop, things grind to a halt. And if they don't have a buffer, and I think a lot of people learned that during, you know, 2020, then they're in deep trouble. If anything, we were lucky 
with COVID because the government stepped in. But the government don't step in because you've fallen and broken your leg or because, you know, your mum needs to be put in a home or, you know, heaven forbid something happens to you or your child or or loved one etc so you know i think people you know that they need to look at profit as being okay first cab off the rank i need to create a uh, a buffer for my business with the profit so yeah. keep keep some of this of it as retained earnings second thing is well what am i going to reinvest back into the business for expansion or hey i've been here for four or five years i do need a new chair i do need you know to give the salon a refit well, where's the money from that going to come from? That's going to come from the profit. Uh, and then the last component is the dividend. So that's a bit that you might keep for yourself. But mm-hmm. even then, you've got to pay tax on that. You know, So um, yeah. it's just getting some simple understanding of what being in business really entails. And if you're not prepared to, to get a, a, a basic financial understanding of how your business works, then uh, you know, be careful because you know, a lot of people come unstuck. And it's yeah. not, they don't come unstuck because they're not good at balayage. They come unstuck because they're not managing their finances properly. Right, right. So part of this is pricing. Pricing has been a big topic the last couple of years. Inflation, of course, reared its ugly head for the first time in many of our lives, really. Mm. Um, you know, I was born in 75. There was a lot of inflation in the 80s, but I was a kid, so I didn't know anything. So we, then we've had, you know, 2%, 3% inflation for, for the majority of the last 40 years. And so all of a sudden, boom, things are going up, you know, 9% you mm. know, per year. Yeah. Cer- certain things going up more, gasoline or petrol, as you say, um, or food, you know, going up at 15% per year or something like that. Um, you know, apartment rent is going up at, 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 at a fast clip. What can the beauty professional do uh, about pricing? Okay, uh, where do we start with that? Um, I hate the meme, charge your worth. I can't stand it. (laughs) Because it's it's said with all the right intent, usually. But it's not as simple as just charge your worth, you know? Um... It depends on your business model. It depends on who your target market is. You know, like if you look at some big brand names, look at, look at Sport Clip, look at, at, at Supercuts, etc. Their business model, their target market is a business model that is about, you know, it's about volume. It's about turnout. It's not about giving people a one hour haircut appointment. It's about get them in, get them out. It's book them down o time. And there is a huge market in our industry that that is the business model for the client that the client wants. And what's more, that the client can afford. And that is the positioning that the business owner puts himself in. So mm. when, you, when you put yourself in that demographic, and one demographic's not better or worse than the other, it's a little bit like trying to compare you know, shopping at Costco to, to, to shopping at, at, at Gucci or Prada or you know, Christian Dior or whatever. There is a market for everybody. And not everybody can be or should try and be Christian Dior. Some people should try and be, you know, Target or whatever, because there's a huge population out there that want Target. So, you know, when we come back to pricing, I think one of the first things is determining, well, where are you positioning your business? Because as soon as you start to understand the positioning of who your target market is, a lot of that stuff about, well, what you're going to charge then um, will impact on that. Uh, And then when you start talking about what you're going to charge, then you have to think about that in relation to and how much time are these appointments going to be. So, you know, there's a lot of people that will say something like, okay, well, I can't charge more than 50 bucks for a haircut where I am. Okay. Uh, now, whether that's true or not is a uh, another story. But the the point is, is that you, if you're going to charge, let, let me let me use a lower a lower number. Someone might say, I can't charge more than twenty five bucks for a man's haircut. Great. If you're going to charge twenty five bucks for a man's haircut, there is a huge market for that. Now, all I'm going to say is you've got to do three or four of them an hour. 
because it's not Anthony saying this, it's the calculator. The calculator says it doesn't work. If you say, I want to charge 25 bucks for a man's haircut, but I want to take one hour for the appointment. It's like, it just doesn't work. It's not an opinion, it's a calculator, it's math. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. if you want to take one hour appointments, then there's going to be a, uh, a likelihood that you're going to be charging. Now, this depends on all those other things that you just mentioned, for example, rent, etc. And obviously, you know, if you're in a, a, a suburb, um, in a small town or whatever, the rent is going to be a lot less than if you're, you know, in downtown LA or New York or whatever. Mm -hmm. So all of these things have a, you know, a role to play in determining what your pricing is going to be, who your target market's going to be, what length your appointments are going to be. And, and that's one of the things that I do on, you know, this money course that I do where I get people to work out what I call their service price per minute. And once you work out and understand your service price per minute based on what your overheads are, what it really costs you to run your business and then factor in a profit margin, then you come up with a number. So let's say that number is, you know, my service price per minute based on getting your profit and loss and going through it and working out what it costs me to run my business for a year, you will come up with an exact figure. And that figure, let's say it came up with, you know, a dollar for ease of math. Let's just say it's a dollar. Uh, and a lot of the time, it's not that far off a dollar as a service mm -hmm. price permit. It might be a dollar five or a dollar ten or a dollar seventeen. Other times it might be, you know, 82 cents or whatever it's going to be. But, you know, a dollar is a nice bit of ease of maths for me. Mm -hmm. So if you get a service price per minute that says it's a dollar, well, if you're going to have a half hour appointment, so it's $1 times 30. You know that in order to cover all your overhead and make the profit that you've built in, that the service price per minute says that you need to be charging a dollar for, for every minute that an appointment is. So it's just a simple case of going, well, if I do a 15-minute appointment, let's say you put a treatment on and you allocate 15 minutes in the book, well, that treatment needs to be a minimum of 15 bucks. Now, can it be more than that? Yeah, happy days. It can be more than that. It could be 30 bucks, and that means it's an extraordinarily profitable service. Likewise, if you said, well, I want to do men's haircuts, but I only want to take one-hour appointments, but, and I said to you, well, how much are you going to charge? And you said 30 bucks. And I'd go, well, hang on, computer says no, or calculator says no. Because if you're going to charge 30 bucks and your service price per minute is $1, you've got to do half hour appointments in order to make that work. Um, so, you know, it's a simple concept and it's a simple formula. So if you're doing, I don't know, a balayage, uh, you know, and you book out three hours to do it, well, that's three hours, 180 minutes. You've got to be charging at least $180. And there's an interesting thing that happens when I do this with salon owners is that oftentimes people will say, I am so profitable. I do so many color corrections or so much balayage and they're really big tickets. But if we took that as an example and, and we said, you know, okay, your, your balayage, let's say using my dollar as a, as a benchmark, uh, let, let's say that you did uh, a balayage, you crossed yourself out for three hours to do it, so it's $180, okay? Uh, slow me down if I'm like, yeah. if you think I'm sort of running too fast no, with this. No. But if it's a three hour appointment, it's $180. Now, let's say you're charging $180 for it, um, or maybe even a little bit more. Now, let's say you're charging $200 for it. Okay, so now it's profitable, but look at how much time was involved, three hours. Whereas a treatment, let's say you've got a treatment and you cross out 15 minutes in the book to apply that a treatment, yeah? The rest of it's a bit of processing time, whatever, where you leave it on. Yeah. And let's imagine you're charging 25 bucks or 30 bucks for that. Well, the, the cost of goods in that treatment is minuscule as a percentage that humble treatment, or another example would be a toner, is so much more profitable in mm. relation to the time uh, that was allocated to do it. And so oftentimes that's a bit of a wake up call for people when they see what their most profitable services actually are. And sometimes it's not the big ticket items. They sometimes get seduced by seeing you know, these big ticket items that are going out, but there's a big time allocation that goes out with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I love everything you just said and it makes a ton of sense and I think it's a great way to look at it. So often, however, people say, well, I'm booked three weeks out or I'm booked four weeks out, um, should I raise my prices? 
So they look at it from that standpoint. And how do you respond to those types of questions? Um, yes. Uh, as a generalization, you know, there's, uh, uh, you know, sort of oftentimes you'll, people, you'll hear people use a figure of 80, 80 or 85 percent. When you're 80 or 85 percent booked, it's time for a price increase. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, can you do that? Yes, you can do that. Is that a good indicator of it's a, it's a, it's a viable time to do it? Then the answer is probably yes. If you're booked, you know, four weeks out. Uh, and and you've got, you're running at eighty five percent productivity, meaning that most of those clients are turning up. You're obviously going to get a few last minute cancellations, sure. no shows, etc. But if you're running at sort of eighty five percent, you know, productivity, uh, and you're booked, you know, four weeks out, well, that's a pretty good sign that you know what I could put my prices up, and you put your prices up, and if you're working by yourself then perhaps you're going to lose some of those clients, never to be seen again. If you're working in a salon where you might have a level system, so tiered pricing, then you might lose those people to someone else in your salon. So if you had a salon with you know multiple staff in it that was tiered pricing, that would be the objective, that if you're going to lose them, you at least want to lose them to your business. Uh, whereas if you're a business unit of one and you put your prices up, well, you might be losing some of those people completely. But here's the good news. So you were 85% booked or 85% productive, but you were booked out solid three or four weeks ahead. You're going to lose a few clients. There's an inevitability about that. But what have you just done? Well, you freed up some space to take on those people that are trying to get in with you. Mm -hmm. So um, at, at a higher were, price. At, a, at the higher price. So mm -hmm. from a business perspective, that can make a lot of sense. Right. Um, but oftentimes, you know, what, one of the things, I think it comes with age, um, is, <laughs> is that I, I used to talk a lot about, you know, absolutes. And there, as I've got older, it's like, do you know what? There are no absolutes. There's lots of other things you might want to factor into this. And the relationship factor with the clients that you've got is sometimes one of those things. And, you know, I'm, I'm a hairdresser. I'm not just the accountant looking at the numbers. I am the hairdresser that has the relationships with these people. And... You know, I, I still want to uh, keep those people. I want to take them with me. I want to look after them. And that's where it can get messy if you're not careful because you have people on different price points based on, you know, loyalty or whatever it is. And I'm not saying don't do that, but I'm saying that that needs to be carefully thought through as to how you do that. Yeah. You know, a lot of the, the price conversation, it, again, wrapped in emotion, fear, um, you you don't want the discomfort with, let's say your great client, Janice, that you've had for many, many years. She just, you know, went through a difficult time, you know, because you talk about it every time she comes in and all. you're doing a price increase, but you, you, you just, you're too afraid to raise the price on Janice because yeah. it's, there's just that human thing there. Mm. And it, it, it makes it, it makes it difficult, and so I like what you just said, and I think it's absolutely true, um, and and I like how you kind of qualified it. You, you need to have a, you need to take a careful look at that. You know, don't just immediately say no, no, no I can't raise the price on Janice. You know, maybe you do a half, you know, increase or something on Janice. And 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 as we're talking about the management of all of these little aspects of this this simple business, but still requires management, you know, it, it brings me to what tools are there available to help? And, you know, I, it, it, that brings me to the booking app uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so w why don't we go there? We've got about five more minutes. What, um, have you delved into the booking app conversation with your coaching? Yeah, um, the market is flooded with them. There yes. are so many, you know, uh, booking, booking platforms now. Uh, and, you know, again, you know, it's like point of sale systems, like full point of sale systems or whatever, is I, I, don't, I don't have a, a particular favorite. If I was a salon owner, like every salon owner, you would say, well, this is my favorite. This is my favorite system, and this is the one I love. Um, it's not necessarily a case of one being better than all the others. It's, well, what, what does what you want it to do? What is the functionality 
that that you need and what delivers that functionality, you know, the best for you. It may not be the best for me, you know, but what does that job the best for you? So there are lots of, um, you know, online booking platforms out there. uh, And, you know, I still come across hairdressers who who don't do online booking. And my, my sort of standard conversation with them is, look, you know, do you do you get an Uber? Yeah, of course I do. Do you get a pizza delivery? Yeah, of course I do. Do you book your holidays online? Yeah, of course you do. Of course I do. Well, guess what? Your clients want to book their haircut appointments online as well. Um, and as an industry, we're often slow in that uptake of technology. But, you know, people do want to book online. And in all the times that, you know, I've had, uh, you know, salon coaching clients that have made that transition from paper to a booking app, I've only ever had one who's gone back to the paper. All the rest of them say the same, exact same things. The first thing they say is, oh my God, it's brilliant. I can't believe how many people book appointments at 11 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night, two o'clock in the morning. Can't believe it. The other thing they say is that, oh my God, it's a bit of a challenge at the beginning with the color appointments. But you just have to manage that like anything. You know, you come into work in the morning, you have a look who's booked in overnight, you have a look at, you know, what they booked it for. If it's a regular client, you might have told them, look, when you, you know, for color, when you rebook in eight weeks, 12 weeks, whatever it is, just book half ahead. You might have written that down on a card for them or whatever it is. So no problem. It's when it's a new client, a new color client that they don't necessarily know what they should be booking for so you know when that happens and you've seen that someone is booked in you don't know who they are well you jump on a call with them maybe you do a zoom consultation to find out if that is what they really need or you know uh, maybe you you know ask them if they can pop in so that before their appointment you can have a look at what it is that they actually want and make sure that you're allocating the right amount of time for it I mean like everything there's ways around these things and you know it does they don't have to be inconvenience to pop in you can do a lot of stuff now you know online with over zoom or facetime or whatever Mm -hmm. and you can do perfectly adequate consultations that way to make sure that you're not wasting anyone's time and you're allocating the right amount of time in for them so i don't know if i don't know if that was the angle that you wanted me to talk about booking apps from well no i thought i think that it was pretty good A, a lot of people ask me which which are the best apps and my feedback is it's really subjective to, to a large degree. I mean, mm. there's hundreds, there's been some consolidation, so, so, so some have bought others, mm. okay? And so there seem to be about 20 main ones. And I recommend to people to look at those 20, but that takes work. You gotta go, you gotta try it out, you gotta maybe do the trial, you gotta look at the website. And you know, to do your homework properly, it takes hours. So most yep. people are like, well, just tell me the top three. Mm. And I usually you know, give them what, what I think you know, might work best for them. If it's a barber, a lot of barbers like you know, one called Squire, you yeah. know, and because it's more of a barber oriented thing. You yeah. know, a lot of ladies, uh, they like Gloss Genius, you yeah. know, or Vigaro or Square or whatever. But um, so it, it's, um, it's oftentimes an answer that, I'm sorry, a question that, that, that uh, whether me, whether I or whether you or somebody else can't give a direct answer to. Yeah, exactly. Um, and like a lot of things, if someone comes out with something that is revolutionary, it doesn't take long before they've all got their version of the same thing. Oh, yeah. They, so, they've all been copying each other. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you, you mentioned Gloss Genius. I mean, their branding is brilliant. Their mm-hmm. marketing is brilliant. Like, mm-hmm. you know, the, the look and they know exactly, this goes back to my marketing thing before, they know exactly who their target market is. Yes. They know exactly who their ideal client is. That's and right. everything from the name of it to the functionality and the look and feel of the platform yes. is aimed at attracting that person. And, and then the other analogy you, you did with the barber one, it's exactly the same thing. So, you know, it, it's not always a case of their one being, you know, better or worse. It's what's better or worse for you. What's a fit for you and your culture and your branding. Right. Well, Anthony, this has been amazing and great to see you. It's always a great conversation. And I feel like, you know, I'm cutting conversation short um, so I, I feel like we have to have another one, but, um, but, uh, you know, 
I, I, I'll go ahead and add, would you like to come back for another one? I'd love to. I'd love okay. to. I always, I always like chatting to you as well. I'm a regular listener oh, to thank your you. podcast. So, you know. Thank you. And I love I, yours too. And I want to. I, I definitely want to encourage our listeners to check out your podcast, Grow My Salon Business Podcast. You do a great job. Just such thank a you. great job. Thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, no, I'm a regular listener to yours. I, I, I do love it. And uh, it keeps me in touch with what's going on, you know, across the pond. And uh, it, it's you. amazing. Like, what did we do before podcasts? And it has now become such a, uh, you know, so overpopulated is not the word. It's still yeah. relatively unpopulated. I know. I mean, I heard somewhere recently there's now four million podcasts. Yes. But, but there's a huge percentage of them that don't get past ten. Right. So they still listeners. might have yeah, listeners. Well, yeah, well, ten, ten listeners and ten yeah. episodes. Oh, ten episodes. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I, I, my understanding is like. Only one or two percent of those podcasts get more than a hundred listeners. Yes. So that's that's yeah. how long that tale is. Yeah, exactly. And if you get to a uh, hundred episodes, you are definitely in the top five percent of all podcasts. Definitely. And I'm being conservative saying that there most you people go. don't get anywhere near that. So uh, we're know, patting like ourselves anything. on the back now. Exactly. Well, it's, it's <laughs> there's a lot of hard work that goes into it. I was talking it, about this with Donovan beforehand. You know, there's a lot of time and no and money that yep. goes into getting a podcast out there every week. But uh, it, it's. Awesome. It's been a very interesting medium for education, and I think on the again there's a there's a, a link I think between podcasting and uh, 2020 uh, and Clubhouse. I love that segue. So we're gonna we're gonna get into that because I've done a little research on how that one has just imploded. Mm. But um, okay, awesome. Until next time, Anthony. Thank you so much. I look forward to it. Cheers. Take care.